Hi, welcome to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Today we're going to talk about some common injuries that occur to the upper extremity. We're talking about the major joints in the arm, that's the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand, and some of the injuries that occur to everyday athletes or people that have work-related injuries. In order to do that, we brought in an expert in this particular area. Joining us today is Dr. David Gentile. Dr. Gentile is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon. He's also board-certified in sports medicine. He's fellowship trained in upper extremity, nerve, and hand surgery, and he's joining us today as a partner in Professional Orthopedic Associates. Dr. Gentile, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and, and uh, um, how your specialty in the upper extremity affects uh, people today. I did my medical training at University of Medicine and Dentistry in Newark. I did my orthopedic residency uh, down at Monmouth Medical Center in Long Branch. And I completed my training with an additional year of upper extremity uh, special, specialty uh, fellowship training at the University of Salt Lake City. Okay, so right now your practice kind of focuses on treatment of that particular area of the body, or do you see other areas as well? Uh, we see, a, it's a sports practice, and so we see some, you know, lower and upper extremity, but primarily I like to focus on the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand injuries, and arthroscopic surgery. Okay, and I know you're the team physician also for Monmouth University, Georgia Court, and several of the high schools in the area? Yeah, both Monmouth and Ocean County, we take care of a lot of the sports teams. Excellent. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the common injuries that occur to the upper extremity. Uh, in order to do that, we need to first review the anatomy of, of what's considered parts of the upper extremity. So can, can you bring us up to speed as to how the bones and joints uh, interact together to form the, the arm? Sure. Um, you know, I'd like to just start with some breaking it down into its components, all right? So your, your structure that holds everything together are your bones, okay? You start out with your humerus, which is your upper arm bone. You have two bones in your forearm, the radius and the ulna. Those are connected at the wrist level to a series of eight small bones. And then you move into your hand bones and your finger bones. Okay. And that's the underpinning structural. These bones have to be held together. And at the joint level, they're usually held together by connective tissue or tough fibrous tissue that binds the bones together. It's called a joint. Okay. And then there are thickenings within that joint that are considered ligaments that actually hold a bone to a bone. So that's the definition of a ligament, which can be confusing for some people. Now you have to move the arm through space, and that's where the muscles come into uh, play here. You have your muscles uh, that connect to the bone through the tendon insertions, and that's the definition of a tendon. So between a ligament injury or a sprain and a muscle injury or a strain, you're dealing with ligaments or you're dealing with the muscle or the tendon of the muscle. Okay, so all these things interact and they form, and they allow motion to the arm. Correct. Um, and, and what we see in our practices usually is that there's two common mechanisms of injury to, to the upper extremity, and that's either overuse or, or trauma. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of injuries that, occur, that can occur and, and what are the common mechanisms of injury and, and how can they be prevented. Sure. So let, let's start with some of the, some of the common things like um, people hear the term tennis elbow. All right. What, what, is, what is tennis elbow and how, how does that occur and, and, and how, do we, how do we prevent it and treat it? Tennis elbow is a condition that affects your elbow. It usually occurs with symptoms on the outside of your elbow away from your body. We refer to it as a tendonitis, but it's really not an inflammatory. It's really an overuse, a cumulative overuse. You're asking the muscles that extend your wrist and extend your fingers to do more than they're capable of on a repetitive basis and your body can't keep up with the repair. And so what happens is you get some pain that may come and go on the outside of your elbow with gripping activities, uh, pulling activities, anything that requires extension or uh, moving back of your wrist um, or forceful grip. Right, and you would see that in, in this particular area of the elbow. Right correct? on the outside of the elbow. Okay. The inside has its own similar configuration, but we call that golfer's elbow, okay. and that deals more with the muscles that bend your wrist or bend your fingers. So most, both of those are from commonly overuse, but the, the public think of, usually thinks of it as an inflammatory process. Now, I know the research that we see now, it's, and, and you see it visually because sometimes you open these joints up. That's it's correct. not always inflammation, correct? Well, it's actually never an inflammation, really. Okay. Um, when you look at it pathologically, when you look at it under a microscope, there were no inflammatory cells. What you see is a scar tissue, a fibrovascular, like scar tissue with blood vessels in it, and it's replaced the normal anatomy of the tendon. A tendon has a very clean, linear, um, uh, smooth, smooth appearance, yeah. 
And when you open up, you'll see kind of an amorphous or a, a bluish kind of no structure to it where the tendon has been repetitively damaged and the body has attempted to repair that. So uh, some people use the term tendinosis instead of tendinitis. Is that something true in this particular That's, case? Yeah, you could think of it like thickened. that. It's a, it's a chronic change of the tendon that even when you're not having symptoms would appear the same to the naked eye or under the microscope and even would appear the same on advanced imaging like an MRI. Okay. So when we, w people call it tennis elbow, it's because of this motion of the backhand is something that's repetitive and overuse in nature. But it, c it could be many other things that can cause that. Most people thing. don't even have any um, history of being a tennis player, <laughs> but they're using their arm in a forceful, repetitive pattern that makes them extend their wrist or bring their wrist up. And you hope that actually when you see them that they've done something like done a renovation project that required a lot of gripping and pulling and pushing rather than just developed it through uh, you know, a relatively sedentary life because then you have an onset of symptoms bound to a change in their activity level as opposed to somebody who's just using their arms more than their arm can take for everyday life, which yeah. is tough to treat. Yeah, and we, and we see it as well for people that, that do a lot of keyboarding. Correct. So any of that repetitive wrist extension. So now somebody comes to your office and they have, they have tennis elbow or they have pain in the inside of the elbow. What is the typical uh, evaluation and course of treatment for these people? I mean, first, whenever you see somebody in the office, you're going to take a thorough history and kind of get the when did this begin, how long has it been going on, you know, what makes it worse, what makes it better. Um, generally, you'll do some screening x-rays to make sure that there's no bony changes bone spurs or lesions that are affecting the bone that are contributing to this. And then you'll do an examination on the person. Typically, you know, they'll have normal range of motion. It may bother them when they fully straighten the elbow out. Uh, they'll have pain localized to the, the tip, the hard bony prominence on the outside of the elbow. And that'll be worse when you ask them to grip or you ask them to extend their wrist and kind of give them some uh, resistance against that. Okay. Now, sometimes they'll require an injection, or sometimes they refer to me for physical therapy. What, what, at what stage do you consider those, those things? Uh, I mean, basically, I'll start off, and depending on the length of symptoms, if somebody just developed it rather acutely, we're going to start with the simple things, you know, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. We're going to go over with them a home exercise program to stretch out the muscle unit, the tendon unit. We're going to maybe immobilize their wrist temporarily so that they're not constantly in that extended pose. We're going to go over activity modifications with them where instead of using their hand palm down to lift things up that way, which they may be uh, characterized or used to using it that way because it's their dominant hand, we're going to ask them to use it in a palm up fashion mm -hmm. because now you've taken those muscles that are involved out of the equation. I think that's the key to, to most of these overuse injuries to the arm is education, number one, teaching them how to avoid some of these things, and then modifications, especially if it's computer-related, their workstation, or it's at their job, that they're using things repetitively or in an awkward position. A hundred percent, because really if I come in and I give you an injection or I give you anti-inflammatories and the symptoms go away, but you don't modify what you're doing, which made the symptoms develop, it's going to come back, mm -hmm. and you can only rely on injections and things like that so often. Yep. If somebody needs help understanding the modifications or if they need help developing or getting into a habit of doing their home exercise program, you know, and they've been doing home exercise and that hasn't worked, I'll usually refer them to physical therapy to get some guidance professionally on how this should be done and what they need to do to reinforce what I've already educated them with. And if it's been going on for an extended period of time, then we come to the injection mm -hmm. of cortisone. You don't want to use that as a first line to just take away the pain because if you take away the pain and they feel they can do everything, they're back in a week saying, my elbow's killing me. It felt great, but now I'm back and I hurt. Yeah. And, we, and we also see that it's not really an inflammatory process, so the cortisone acts as an anti-inflammatory. So is there other things that you use in that injection to help with that, or well, what, what is the cortisone actually doing then? Yeah, you know, that's the funny question. If there's no inflammation, why does it work? Yeah. <laughs> and they don't really know. They don't really understand. I mean, the common... Um, wisdom that I've heard in the societies is if you have something that works for you, keep doing it. <laughs> My thought is this. I use a combination of things. I use some cortisone in the injection plus some short acting and some long acting Novocaine basically. That gives me an idea in the office because I've anesthetized what I think is the painful, the pain generator. And if your pain goes away in the office and for the first 24 hours, I know I'm in the right spot mm -hmm. and we're identified what's making the pain because you can have some synovitis or inflammation inside the elbow joint. You can have some nerve compressions that can mimic it. 
and if I anesthetize you and you don't get pain relief, that's not the source. Got it. So you're using it diagnostically as well. Diagnostically and therapeutically. Yep. And then the other thing that I think helps is when I'm needling it, um, we'll kind of put the needle in so that you don't have to have any pain for the rest of this, but then I'll repetitively kind of stimulate the tendon with the needle. I'll, I'll even touch the bone in order to draw some bleeding into the area. And I think some of the deep tissue massage, which maybe increases blood flow, um, the needling, um, kind of plays on to this new thing that they've been talking about. You've heard a lot of it with the sports with the uh, PRP, the mm -hmm. platelet-rich plasma injections that have these stem cells or cells that are capable of healing tissue. Mm -hmm. I think that may be some of the reason that the cortisone injection works because I'm bringing blood supply there. Because that's what the surgery is about, is mm -hmm. bringing some blood supply after you've excised scar tissue and having these cells that can do anything make new tendons. So using the body's natural uh, substances to help heal things. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what we do and in physical therapy. I'm doing a lot of deep cross friction massage and really trying to stimulate some blow f blood flow to the area. And it's not the most comfortable thing, but it really does work because it brings the blood flow and gets some of the byproducts out of the tendon. Yeah, and people are, are you know, kind of hesitant <clears throat> to do something that hurts. Yeah. But I tell them, I say, find that spot where it really, really hurts Just in the shower every morning yep. and dig your thumb in as much as you can tolerate it for five minutes. Okay. And I think that works because of the same reason, blood Good. flow. So we're going to move on a little bit. And you talked briefly about the medial elbow, but now it's spring coming. We're going to have a lot of pitching and baseball throwing. And let's get the audience to understand some of the mechanisms as to why not only the kids, but the softball players and everybody else develops this medial elbow pain. What, what's going on there with that? There are several reasons why an overhead athlete can have medial elbow pain. And it also depends on how old they are. You know, are, is this a person who still has a growing skeleton or are they an adult? Because some of the onset of the pain or some of the reason for the pain can be a little bit different. In a growing skeleton, they can actually have pain from the growth plate or the place where the bone grows from, which is a weak point when they're growing, especially at that 13, 14 when their muscles have developed and they've gotten stronger but their body hasn't quite caught up with it. Whereas an adult is not going to have pain at a growth point in a, in a mm -hmm. bone because it's already closed, they're going to have pain from the tendon or maybe even from irritation of the nerve itself. Um, and if they overuse the arm, if they overthrow it past the point that their muscles can protect the joint, okay? Because when you're throwing, you are using your muscles to slow down the joint because that throwing motion, if you've ever seen slow motion photography of throwing, it's a crazy position their arm is in. It acts as a decelerator. It really? slows the arm down yep. so that the bones aren't just jarring and coming to an end point. Mm -hmm. But if you throw past the point where your muscles can control that, now you have to rely on those things we talked about, the joint and the ligaments. And you can actually start to damage either one time traumatic episode, I throw so hard I just tear the ligament, or I stretch it out over time. Mm -hmm. And you can get you know, a sprain of the collateral ligament, or a, a, you know, and that uh, can result in, in instability. Okay, and, and some people don't understand is that, you know, the injury is occurring here, but a lot of the problems are what we call proximal, either a weakness in the shoulder, imbalance, or weakness in your, in your trunk, and your legs, and all that stress is being taken up here. And I've, I've worked on some prevention videos and stuff that are on my website to start educating the youth and their parents about how to work on this balance, especially now before the season. Yeah. That, that's really important. Well, I think that if you have to look at the throwing mechanism, all right? Your throwing mechanism, about half of your power comes from your legs and your back. Mm -hmm. They generate the power, and then it's translated into a rotation and acceleration of the arm, which delivers the ball to the plate. And if you look at your leg muscles and your back muscles, how large they are relative to your arm muscles, there's just no difference. I mean, there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the flexibility in your hips or your back or you're not stepping out correctly, you can't make up that loss of power by the small muscles in your arm without overusing them. Absolutely. And so they have to have good mechanics from their core to translate into the arm. The arm is really just the final translation of that power. Okay, when we come back after the break, we're going to talk about what some of the treatment is for these type of injuries, especially when things go really bad and injuries to the inside of the elbow. My husband, Hank, he taught me to live like there's no tomorrow, and we did it all. European vacations, expensive cars, the best restaurants. Life was great till he died. Now there are no tomorrows for Hank. 
but they're all I've got. Because we never saved a dime. Welcome back to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. We're joined today by Dr. G David Gentile, who's a board-certified orthopedic surgeon with a specialty in upper extremity uh, injuries and surgery. Dr. Gentile, again, welcome to the show. Thank you. We were talking before the break about um, the medial elbow problems that develop, and especially in pitchers. And um, we, we talked about, you know, what's happening, what's happening to the tendon, the overuse. Now what happens when things go bad? Let's talk about the worst case scenarios, and not necessarily just in the kids, but in the, the older athletes, or even uh, work-related injuries where it gets really bad. What are some of the treatments for these chronic elbow injuries that really don't respond? Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, you've already gone through the therapy, you've gone through the bracing, you've tried to heal the injury by resting it. And at this point, you're going to do some advanced imaging to see, is there something structurally wrong with this joint? You know, do you have some muscle tears at the, uh, of, the, of the flexor muscles and the pronator muscles on the inside of the elbow? Or has it gone even deeper and have you started to affect the ligaments that hold the elbow joint together? And because of the forces, there's a great deal of force that wants to push the elbow out in an L shape during throwing. And you can either um, slowly stretch out that ligament, or you can actually rupture it if the force is great enough at one particular time. And that, may, that prevents kind of this in and out motion of the elbow. Correct. Right? It gives okay. some stability to the elbow. Okay. So if you're a person who doesn't have any overhead throwing or anything that really puts your arm in stress when it's out away from your body, like a tennis player, you can probably allow it to heal, and even though you may have some laxity, you can live with it. We don't have to have a medial collateral ligament to live. It actually heals fairly well. Um, but if you're an overhead throwing athlete or any kind of overhead athlete, racket sports, then you really need that stability because of the forces you're going to subject your arm to when you make contact with that ball away from your body. Okay. And in those cases, you may have to come to the point where you need a surgery. Okay? And that's the classic Tommy John a lot of people have heard about where you'll open up the elbow joint, you'll assess it at the time of surgery with x-rays and doing a stress examination while the patient's asleep to confirm what your suspicion is that they have an instability problem based on your diagnosis, history, and imaging that you did beforehand. And if so, then you'll proceed with rebuilding that connection between the two bones. Much like a person will have an ACL reconstruction for their knee, you actually remake a ligament that connects the two bones. Okay. And what happens with the nerve in that area? I know sometimes you have to move the nerve or Yeah, things. I mean, routinely in the, in the previous uh, time, they would always move the nerve. But then they started to notice that some people that didn't have any feeling of numbness or tingling had nerve symptoms after their nerve was manipulated. And so I think the indications have changed for that now. If person has nerve-related injuries when they throw, if they get numb fingers and they have a lax ligament, then you need to move it and do something about the nerve. But you can actually approach the ligament area where you need to do your reconstruction safely without manipulating the nerve once you've identified it if they have no nerve symptoms. Got it. So kind of the, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Yeah, the nerve runs kind of in that real, the groove right where the ligament is, and sometimes it's anatomically your, it's an issue. It's your classic funny bone. Funny you hit the inside yep. right behind that bony, you know, protuberance right on the inside, and your nerve is right behind that. Um, okay. And the ligament runs just in front of that, connecting that bony prominence to your forearm bone, the ulna. And we see a lot of the professional baseball pitchers that un undergo this typically become better pitchers later on. And I think the theory is is that they've gone through so much strengthening and rehabilitation that they build the areas that really have been weak to cause this problem. Is that right? Right. I think they probably had some kind of imbalance or some throwing mechanism that needed to be fixed so that they're not translating all that force that's supposed to be generated in their legs and back. They're trying to generate it at the shoulder and elbow level and you just can't make up for it. So they blow it out. And mm -hmm. if you address all those issues so aggressively, they can throw better. I mean, the success rate is about 90%. And you need to understand one thing. As we're seeing this procedure done in 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, much younger athletes because of the level of competition and the fact that they're playing all year round, you need to have a frank conversation. They say 90% of professional baseball players will go back and play professional ball again. Well, that's true. But when they became hurt, they were a professional baseball player. Mm -hmm. If you're a little league pitcher or an AAU pitcher and you hurt your ligament and you have to have it reconstructed, you can come probably back to the level that you pitched at. 
but you may not be a high school level pitcher or be able to progress to a college level or a semi-professional level. So it's a 90% return to the level you were at when you got hurt. Yeah, that's, that's important and parents should understand that, that really the key to this is, is prevention and identifying it early and then making sure the pitch counts are maintained and the rest is adhered to and all the things to prevent the problem because once it gets too far and we've both seen those where it pulls the bone off and all kinds of problems occur and, and how key is that really to this process? That's, that's the, the whole key. Mm -hmm. I mean basically you know in the off season rather than playing baseball three seasons on three different teams what you need to do is you need to strengthen to prepare for your sport then as you get closer, less strengthening, more technical, you need to get into a throwing program for a few months beforehand and really build up the arm to withstand the stress of throwing. And then during the season, you throw. And then when the season's over, you take a rest period and you start over again. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is no strengthening and baseball three seasons of the year. Mm -hmm. If you keep on doing that, the body never has a chance to repair itself and it will fail. Just breaks down. And you know, especially on multiple teams, it's really the parent's responsibility to maintain that pitch count. Mm -hmm. They have to know how many pitches that kid threw on team one, team two, and team three, and they need to add them together. Yeah. <laughs> because the coaches don't know, yep. and they can't protect the kid. There, you have to protect There them. needs to be the gatekeeper. Yeah. And, and I think the, the other important point is they need to do some other things besides baseball. The strength thing is important, but let them play basketball. Let them play other sports. Be a three-season athlete playing yeah. three different sports. Yes, and that's important. And you see a lot of times now this focused, and we just see so many overused problems with these kids. So it's really an essential point. Let's move on down the chain a little bit here and talk about another common area, which is injuries to the wrist. And one that's always in the news that people hear about is, is carpal tunnel problems. Just briefly review the, the anatomy of this particular area and what is carpal tunnel syndrome. All right. Carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common nerve compression or um, nerve disorder of the arm, okay? It's a compression of the median nerve, and usually people will complain of numbness or tingling or a heaviness that will involve primarily the thumb, the middle, and the index <coughs> finger, maybe the hand, and sometimes it will radiate proximally. It will come up the forearm and very rarely even have people with shoulder pain. Um, and mostly it occurs at night or can occur with repetitive tasks during the day, uh, especially activities that cause wrist flexion or maintain wrist flexion or bending, because it puts pressure on the nerve. And, excuse me, basically the carpal tunnel is a small area that is bounded on three quarters of its uh, circumference of the circle by the bones of your wrist that make kind of a U shape. And then over the top of the U shape, you have a transverse carpal ligament. And with any container that has a fixed dimension, if the pressure inside increases because of increased blood flow, tenosynovitis, um, anything like that, then the, the pressure has to go up. And it doesn't take very much pressure to start to affect the flow of um, nutrients and chemicals important for the nerve function to happen. So it's the compression of the nerve. I like to tell people that the space is about the diameter of a finger and you have all the tendons in the fingers go through there, the blood supply and this little nerve. So it's a tight little space. It's a tight little space and the tendons really don't have very much in the way of cells. So they, they can tolerate not having a lot of pressure applied to them. They don't care. But your nerve is very vascular, very alive, and a small amount of pressure can actually stop the flow. And if you're not getting the nutrition from one part of the nerve to the end where it does its job, it stops functioning and you start to get feelings of numbness. You may start to get fatigue in the muscles of the thumb. Uh, you may even get atrophy. You may start to notice your thumb is, is losing its muscles. You know? Yeah, because the median nerve kind of supplies, so people understand, supplies the movement of the thumb, right, and it supplies sensation kind of in this half of the hand. Correct. So they'll start feeling symptoms along there and uh, they'll often, the problem's really occurring here. So, and we see it a lot in people that do a lot of gripping and pinching and keyboarding, any other particular things that irritate? Vibration, um, Vibration. is, is a, a kind of a nerve toxin. So guys that are running the jackhammer or using a lot of power tools, that is not a particularly healthy thing. If you can isolate yourself from the vibration, that's good. Um, conditions where you're in repetitive forced postures that put increased pressure, either a lot of flexion, bending, or a lot of extension of the wrist, both of those things are not um, desirable. Yeah, and, and the other thing that I uh, teach patients about is, is their posture because 
the neck position and the shoulder where the nerves come out of is really important for the compression that's going on down here. So they might think that it's because of what's happening here, but they're sitting at their computer and their neck's sticking out like that, and all that compression to the nerve bundle really causes irritation. Well, and you know, the, the, what you have to understand is the, the nerve body, the part that you know, controls how the nerve works, is actually contained up in you know, your neck area. Mm -hmm. And then it's like a long cable that comes down to supply sensation or feeling to your fingers and supply the power so that your muscle can work. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's kind of like you're cutting the telegraph wire and you're cutting it off from its supply base, which is up here. Yeah, but you gotta, you gotta address this area, especially people that require surgery. So let's talk about, if they don't respond to conservative care, what is actually involved in carpal tunnel surgery? Carpal tunnel surgery is usually a day-stay procedure, okay? They've usually had a trial of splinting anti-inflammatories, and they've usually had like a nerve study done, uh, which is called an EMG nerve conduction, and they evaluate the health of the nerve by stimulating it electrically and you determine how badly is the nerve involved. Is it just the part that gives you feeling to your hand, or is it also the part that gives you some power to the muscle? And how is the muscle responding to that compression? So early on, if it's only sensory, just the feeling, and that's the only part that's affected, I'll offer them an injection. If they've gotten to the point that they've failed all the conservative, or they're starting to show signs that their muscle is atrophying or you know, weakening, mm -hmm. then the surgery involves it can be a series of different incisions. One incision can occur on the palm, kind of at the base of the thumb, directly over the ligament. There are also endoscopic techniques, which can involve one or two incisions remote from where the ligament is, and actually don't involve dividing the skin over the ligament, but just dividing the ligament from inside. You actually go into the carpal tunnel and look up and release the roof of it. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's opening up that space. Basically, there's too much pressure. You've released the ligament, the ligament will gap, and now your volume, the space available increases, so the pressure decreases. And it's that decrease in pressure that patients will usually almost immediately notice their hand doesn't fall asleep anymore at night, and the repetitive stuff that used to make their hand go numb gets better right away. And that's what the patient wants. Mm -hmm. But me as an orthopedic hand surgeon, I tell them the long-term thing is, I don't want your nerve to get any worse than it is. And it'll continue to recover for up to a year. But if you had very bad electrical studies before the surgery, you may still have bad studies but they're better than what they were. Mm -hmm. And so I always warn people, you know, don't go by the absolute number. If you've had carpal tunnel and you got better, and then you go to see somebody and you have some numbness and they do another nerve state, say, oh, we've got carpal tunnel. No, let's look at the first one and say, is point A, you know, is this point better than this point? And if it is, then it's just that's as much as their nerve could recover because they don't have a lot of regeneration. And the other important thing is don't go back to the things that caused it to begin with, right? 100%. So the repetitive motion, you have to modify some of the things. You have to break. I, I tell people, you know, if you do something like this, you know, 5,000 times a day, periodically you've got to go in the other direction. So that's where the repetitive motion comes in and the education because those people that have the release, they go back and their, their hairstylist or whatever, it just it can develop again, correct? They, they need to modify their habits. They need to modify their work behaviors or their recreational activities to do it in a different way that doesn't cause that repetitive nature of, of what causes these injuries. Yeah, and, and, and think about it as kind of don't go back and you know, some people just go and they'll grip a ball. It's kind of the worst thing. You're doing more compression, more repetitive nature. It needs rest, needs some gentle stretching, needs reducing inflammation, and number one, changing the activity. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks very it. much for having me. And you heard today from Dr. David Gentile. We talked about common injuries to the upper extremity, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks again for joining us on You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone.